All right. Well, I'm here with uh, Caitlin and Alan and uh, to talk about service life. But first, I've got uh, this article in the Washington Post, which is quite amazing. There are two conjoined twins conjoined at the head, so they're sharing one brain. Their brain, their skulls are fused and their brains are together, and they were, I think, four or five years old, and they successfully separated them, which I think has never been done before with children that sort of uh, conjoinment and that and that old. And this took a whole lot of surgeons, some in Brazil and some elsewhere, connecting by virtual reality and a long time. It's a uh, very remarkable accomplishment of surgery. And apparently they're both doing okay. So uh, on the other hand, Alan's got people that are gonna dig their own grave. <laughs> yes, there's a really entertaining article uh, uh, in the motherboard, Vice motherboard, uh, written by Joseph Cox entitled, I'm gonna make you dig your own grave about a certain character on Twitter who has taken it upon him or herself to dox hackers. And so it's a real throwback action to the early days of hacking when um, everyone was independent and there were a lot of flame wars and the worst thing that could happen was to, uh, as a hacker, was to get doxed. The stakes have gotten a little bit higher since then. And uh, this, this uh, threat intelligence researcher who moonlights as pancake, that's pancake with a, a three for an E, um, pancake has taken it upon themselves to uh, post pictures and identifying information, uh, including up to passport uh, images of passports on Twitter and Substack. And uh, so this particular article has a number of very entertaining screenshots in which the um, alleged hackers make death threats against Pancake, um, when one case brags about being involved in a ransomware attack that may have uh, led to the death of an infant that was on life support. And the hacker said, quote, I'm proud of this. Um, the hackers have also uh, promised to kidnap Pancake and keep Pancake, quote, in my storage to die. So it, it gets rather violent. And of course, some of these hackers involved in the ransomware gangs are connected to um, organized crime and or to nation state uh, uh, security apparatuses. So it's not inconceivable that they could actually make something happen to Pancake if uh, Pancake's identity were to be found out. Um, however, Twitter has taken Pancake's account down as of now. And so I suppose that's the end of that. But um, uh, it is, at least in my eyes, a rather entertaining and amusing throwback to another time of, of doxing. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have done that stuff. Um, I know Brian Krebs does a lot of it and he gets in a lot of trouble. Yes, although it's a little different in Brian Krebs' situation because oftentimes it's other hackers who are feeding him this information. And so it's one gang uh, using Brian Krebs to dox another gang. Uh, yep. So he's in a way he's playing into their agendas, whereas Pancake um, supposedly, at least claims in this article, to work in the cybersecurity industry as a threat analyst. So um, it's a little bit of a different situation there. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't say Brian Krebs. I think what you have is just Brian Krebs is more significant. And once you're significant, you're a player in the game. And these well, outside vigilantes like Pancake uh, have like no allies, not even any temporary alliances on the other world. Yeah, it's true that Brian Krebs is uh, more visible and more online. Nobody's taken him down yet successfully. Well, and he's got a big reputation. He so, does. So, I mean, he's he just a major player. Although it, it, in this article, um, the author does interview uh, named threat researchers who say that their uh, information more or less aligns with what Pancake has posted. Yeah, so he's not just making it up. Yeah. No, th yeah. this is not just fiction. It would be nice to imagine that this stuff would be done by uh, police who have like protection, but it does seem to be done by random uh, 
individual unprotected vigilantes law. <laughs> right. And Pancake does claim in the article that uh, they have shared information with law enforcement and that uh, they are interested in that, but does not go beyond saying anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, it's a questionable threat response issue to decide whether what you're, been, what you're accomplishing here is really worth the risk to you and your family. And that's just the thing is that apparently Pancake has taken down some posts because of threats made to their family. So yeah, <laughs> threats do work. Well, yeah, of course, threats at a certain level will totally work. It reminds me of the case of Brittany Griner, where they're saying, you know, uh, you shouldn't trade prisoners. But on the other hand, you shouldn't just leave Americans rotting in Russian jail. And there's just no good answer. Anyway, so Caitlin has got the top story, the printers. Printers, yes, everybody loves printers and stories about printers, of course. Actually, I'm one of the few people that likes printers, but I, I know what this article is talking about. And I've known this for a while, and I'm glad that, that this article is bringing this up. So uh, this, uh, okay, perfect. So Gizmodo has an article written by Andrew uh, Liz, Liz, Liz Wooski. I, I, I probably, I apologize for butchering this person's name. Uh, talking about how Epson printers will stop working after a certain amount of time. Uh, so this is a perfect, perfect example of planned obsolescence. Uh, what's going on is that there are these pads inside inkjet printers that collect excess inks uh, to prevent damage to the printer in the event that the ink cartridge breaks or that you know too much ink is is released uh, they're actually vitally important to the operation of the printer like the printer needs those pads to operate however those pads have a limited lifespan and once those pads were out even though the entire printer otherwise is perfectly functional uh you that you get an error message on your epson printer saying hey you know time to buy a new printer uh, now these pads are fully replaceable you can if you know what you're doing you can take apart your printer you know replace these pads get your printer operational again of course most users do not are not going to be doing that so they'll just throw out their printer uh get a new one they don't make it easy this is not a, a trivial it's not a super difficult but it's not a trivial uh fix uh as with if you've ever taken apart a lot of printers uh you'll find that there's so many gears and stupid little mechanisms in there. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and then putting it back together again is such, such a hassle. Uh, but but you, it can technically be fixed, but it won't. And so the issue, of course, is that when people are buying these printers, they don't know that there's a limited lifespan, right? That you buy a printer, you think, oh, this will last for 10, 20 years, whatever. If I want a new one, I can upgrade later. Uh, you just buy a cheap printer, that's fine. Uh, well, no, a lot of these printers do have lifespan and they are really destined to go into landfill um, the second they're bought, essentially. You can't just keep using them forever and ever. Uh, they have components that will wear, wear out and no easy way to replace them. It's sort of like uh, like iPhone batteries where you know you buy an iPhone and you know that the, the battery, of course, is going to wear out over time. And this is in part due to just physics and the fact that we can't make better batteries. And also I'm sure part due to Apple's marketing uh, or cell phone marketers who do want those batteries to wear out and people to buy new phones every you know few years. So it's, it's a win-win situation. <laughs> um, and it, so that's what's going on with these printers is that they, are, you know, people aren't really understanding how, you know, that, that the, that these printers have a limited lifespan. And so my advice to anybody buying a printer is this, go on to Amazon or, or your wherever you shop for your printer refill, um, ignore inkjet printers completely. Okay? Don't, don't even bother with an inkjet, get a laser um, and find toner uh, from a third party, not from the, the manufacturer, like a third party knockoff toner, and then find the printer that goes to, um, and then buy that printer. <laughs> uh, that's going to be, that's probably going to be your, your best bet. Uh, avoid inkjets and then buy a laser printer that is not locked down into proprietary toner cartridges. Yep. Sounds like a good case for product reviews. Yep. All right. And so uh, drive savers 
has cracked the M1 in the following sense. They got a damaged M1 Mac, and they managed to figure out how to transplant the CPU and the other chips to a fresh board to get the data off it. And they do not give very much details, but they say Apple has, as usual, tried to make this very difficult. Um, they have, you have to have not only the original chip, M1 chip, but there's a bunch of other chips they don't label that you have to find the essential chips and move them all in order to get in. And the thing that they do not tell me in the article, which would be the most interesting thing, this is an article of Digital Trends, is whether you had to have the user's password. And that I think is the critical thing because the immediate question is, could a crook do this to take the data off your Mac? And supposedly not without your password because there's layers of encryption. And if Drive Savers has figured out how to do it without the user's password, then this is real important for both crooks and for forensic examination. If they require the user's password, then of course it's useful only for data recovery, which is their main business. But anyway, um, even just recovering it, even with the user's password is almost impossible. Uh, on the M1, which is why Apple says you should be using a time machine to make a backup all along. That's the recommended crash recovery solution. But if you didn't, then uh, as far as I know, Drive Savers is the only company that can get your stuff back. So right. on 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 Apple computers, they they usually use something called File Vault, which is very similar to right. other encryption right. software encryption stuff on on Windows. Uh, what's it called? Yeah. Um, BitLocker. BitLocker, yes. Uh, and that's all done in software. So regardless, you you if you get access to the to the drive, and it has file vault on it, you you need a password, regardless of what machine you're. You that's know, what reading, I was reading the data from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we'll hope, presumably, if this was not protected by file vault. Yeah, and and I, I've said this before. Um, I've dealt with a lot of people's systems. Uh, where they lost all their data because they decided they needed to encrypt their drive for no reason. Right. Um, you know, encrypting drives, there's good reasons to encrypt drives. You have like corporations, they're dealing with, you know, information that could be easily stolen by, you know, bad actors and stuff like that. Um, I don't believe that encrypting your drive is necessarily the best bet if you value being able to recover your data. Um, and unfortunately, Apple has decided that by default, apparently, they're going to encrypt all their drives which does make you know file recovery very difficult. So, yeah. But if you know their password, it should be all right, right? Correct. Well, if you know their password or if you know the, the backup password. Uh, so the way that a lot of these uh, encryption systems work on drives is that you actually have um, a, a whole bunch of ways to decrypt the drive. In FileVault's case, you can, you can attach uh, multiple people's accounts uh, to be able to unlock sort of a master key. And there's the same with BitLocker too. So like if if you have BitLocker, for example, you can have a password to decrypt your drive. You can have a backup password to decrypt your drive. You could use the TPM chip to decrypt your drive. And all that's doing is it's going in and grabbing a master key. So yeah. if you also have that master key as well, uh, you can do some hacking and decrypt it that way as well. Yeah, I think when they brought up BitLocker, Microsoft would encourage you, if you did turn this on, to make a copy of the key up in your cloud so you'd always have it, which seems like a very good plan for most people. Yeah, most end users aren't going to do that. That's why I don't recommend um, encrypting your drives if you if you value data recovery. Um, yeah. if, if you are dealing with sensitive data, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah. No, that's certainly the case. The number one effective encryption is to lock out your authorized users. It's, yes. Uh, it, it's a highly, it's an expensive solution. You're going to lose a lot of data by accident and you have to accept that cost. And you're right. If that's, if that's more, if losing your data is more important than having private documents be leaked out, as is the case with many corporate it, and um, government agencies, yeah. then encryption is for you. If, if you would rather be able to not brick your computer and have to have all your data erased, you probably don't want encryption. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then what you need to do is have like an IT department that carefully implements it with a proper backup account. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And so Alan's got small time crooks. Yeah, so I came across this blog posting on uh, Cisco Talus, uh, uh, posting entitled Small Time Cybercrime is About to Explode. We Aren't Ready. And I immediately got very interested in it because I've always wondered why there aren't more small time. Uh, cybercrime actors out there. It seems like such a good opportunity um, to make money and to not get caught, really, because law enforcement's generally insufficient uh, to 
Sam, you're looking very skeptical. <laughs> well, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to hear the explanation. I mean, my initial thought is there's a huge learning curve to be a well, and, and and that's just the thing is that there is a huge learning curve. However, um, various actors have made ransomware as a service or malware as a service platforms. And so they are making it easier. And I think you can only get on those if you get on the right forums that are hard to find and then you prove your, your legitimacy by dumping credit card numbers or something, right? Right, exactly. And oftentimes those are also limited by language. So you have to demonstrate that you are a fluent speaker of Russian, for example. Um, yeah. And they might even insist that you have a call with them so that they can verify that you can fluently speak the language. Um, but at any rate, you would think that there are tremendous opportunities out there to uh, cast a wider net, shall we say, by bringing in, roping in more low level actors. Um, after all, uh, money mules have been used for quite a long time and a lot of credit card scammers have used uh, mules, essentially mules for a long time. So um, you would think that there, there should be more opportunities for the smaller cybercrime uh, ne'er-do-well, shall we say. I think but, it's better to just uh, rob a liquor store. You know? Well, and that's exactly the thing. So I thought this, this blog posting would bring some new insights and instead did not. Uh, so this is a call out of, of, if anything, of Cisco Talos, because this is a, one of the worst written, um, poorly researched blog postings I've ever seen from a threat, uh, especially a tier one threat intelligence company. Um, in this blog posting, the author talks about how we've seen a tremendous increase in, um, complaints and, and losses from ransomware and malware in the past five years. And then he jumps to the pro, uh, what's been happening with uh, drug and weapons felonies in only New York City uh, and the arrests that have been made by the New York Police Department. And he finds that while weapons arrests have been holding more or less steady, they've declined slightly, drug arrests are way down, nearly 75%. Um, between 2013 and 2021. And somehow he thinks that this is either correlated or causative of the, uh, an increase in cybercrime activity on the part of criminals in New York. I think it's just law enforcement priorities, right? Well, that's exactly it. It's probably law enforcement priorities, changing demographics, um, different behaviors. And that's only New York City. That's not the entire country. Uh, obviously, the country has uh, got far more of a fentanyl and opioid problem today than it did in 2013. So this is just an awful, awful blog posting in which there's no solid evidence shown of any real increase in local small scale cybercrime activity. Uh, at, at, while uh, speculations, making speculation, speculating and some hand waving about how this is going to be an inevitable trend because other crimes seem to be on the decline. Okay, well, there's no end of uh, uninformed takes, although you'd like to hope for better from Cisco. Yes. All right. And Caitlin has got electric cars. Uh, no, I don't actually. I don't have any electric cars because they're too gosh darn expensive. Uh, the Washington, uh, no, the New York Times, I should say, has an article uh, talking about how electric cars are just too gosh darn costly. Uh, even with the new uh, climate change bill, which is aiming to reduce the cost of electric vehicles and give tax credits, which, by the way, has problems in and of itself we're not going to get into. Apparently, very few vehicles actually qualify for this tax credit. Possibly so people, zero. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like all the, like they have they have requirements like it has to be entirely sourced in the United States, which like almost no cars do. Um, so if you want to get like a Japanese electric vehicle, you're not going to get any tax credits and stuff. So anyway. Um, uh, the, the big problem, of course, is that cars are expensive and they're only getting more expensive, especially with the um, with the shortages and the supply chain issues that we're currently having. So we've, we've talked for a while about how even used cars are going up in value because, you know, no one can make the new cars anymore. 
uh, because of just the, the shortage shortages in components. And it turns out that electric cars in particular are, are specifically very egregious in terms of its pricing and, uh, and being aimed towards uh, wealthier Americans, which means that you know, a lot of Americans are just priced out of electric vehicles, meaning they're basically forced to use, you know, gasoline, which of course is also very expensive at the moment. Um, I think it's going down, but uh, I wouldn't, I don't know for sure. I don't keep super close tabs on, on gas prices, but, um, you know, it's, it's a big problem that we need to combat climate change. We're telling people, you know, you should be moving to electric cars and yet, you know, base model electric cars are going for like 40, starting at like $45,000 when a few years ago they're starting at like 35,000. So the cost of these cars are going, you know, up and up and up and just average Americans cannot afford it. Um, and so, and, and the thing is that these companies very much are relying on the prestige of being, of having electric cars being seen as a luxury good. Uh, so it is entirely possible to make low cost electric vehicles. In fact, this article talks about one they made in China called the Wuliang uh, Hongwang Mini EV. Uh, and it was produced by General Motors and uh, some Chinese automakers. And I probably totally botched that pronunciation. However, uh, it else outsells that the Tesla Model 3, which is the older Tesla, um, and it goes for $4,500 for an entire electric vehicle. Now, the problem with this electric vehicle is that it's the exact uh, product that all the people in favor of gas guzzling vehicles think all electric cars are. Like it, it has, it barely goes anywhere. Uh, it has like a hundred, it can, it's range is slightly over a hundred miles on new batteries. And it's going to go down to like half or less than that on older batteries. And it doesn't top over 60 miles per hour. So it's like, Sounds you know, it, what? Sounds perfect for me. Yeah, I know. It's, it's perfect for some people. Absolutely. If, if you barely drive around, actually, Sam, this would not be good for you because you, you come to Sunnyvale every weekend and that car would not, would not make the full trip from Sunnyvale. Uh, back to San Francisco. It's only 30 miles, but you're uh, right. You're right. It might not. It might yeah. not. Yeah. And, and also uh, over... apparently the charging stations aren't fast enough and there aren't enough of them. And yeah. a lot of people can't charge at home. And we're, I, we're not going to manage to have like an all electric fleet in five years. Like people think we are. We're just no. not. No, if you're, if you're in the wealthy demographic, like you're in Congress, you're Republican or Democrat in Congress, you know, you can afford an electric car. That's fine. I mean, if you're moderately wealthy in the United States, you can afford an electric car. In fact, it's probably going to save you money on gas in the long run and stuff. But if you are not moderately wealthy, you cannot afford these these vehicles. And even if you could, you know, if we were to bring out these vehicles, uh, they would be just terrible products that would in no way compete with the old gas guzzling uh, uh, cheapo machines we had in the past. So, you know, it's just, it's, I hate to say it, but until, you know, these prices go way, way down, electric vehicles are still not ready for mainstream. Yep. Yep. We're in for a bit of chaos as the uh, government tries to force the conversion to electricity before the market is actually ready. Right. And and I do support that. I do think electric vehicles on are better than gas guzzling vehicles. I am, I'm fully in support of it, but we got to be realistic. <laughs> they are just way priced out of most people's budgets. Well, in California and in San Francisco in particular, reality is often not considered in government policy. So we'll be on the cutting edge. We'll be early adopters. We'll see how this goes. Uh, hopefully we can apply more, more credits and help people, you know, afford them. But even so, that's just giving handouts to large, you know, automakers who really probably don't even need those big handouts, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Well, yep. It, we are going to live in more interesting times. Anyway, so they have now got a Lyme disease vaccine. There hasn't been a new one in 20 years. The only one they ever made was for children only, and they couldn't sell enough of it to make it economically viable. So they made a new one, which is good for both adults and children. And this sounds like a good idea. I mean, if, if you go out in the wild at all, there's a problem with ticks and Lyme disease is apparently really a drag. I've known a lot of people that get it. And uh, it would be nice to have a vaccine. So I hope this moves ahead and you can, in fact, this one, this article I saw is on Al Jazeera. It must be everywhere. 
um, you can sign up to be in the trial. So they need thousands of volunteers to test the vaccine. So uh, I hope they do that and come up with a good vaccine. And Alan has got monkeypox, for which there is a vaccine. Um, yes, also known as smallpox vaccines. Um, you know, the U.S. CDC, Centers for Disease Control, has not done a very good job of managing the monkeypox epidemic so far. They don't and seem it isn't do much of anything right, do they? No, no. You it just seem to be a bunch COVID. of out of touch academics babbling about nonsense and not really saving lives. Well, but they're not even academics. You know, these are people who are involved in public health policy. And uh, CDC was, prior to the COVID pandemic, considered the best um, health agency in the world. And so it was very highly regarded and it had indeed had many past successes, except as the COVID outbreak proved, the CDC is um, deeply compromised by political issues and even well, might have been a whole mess of age for the first several years, I think, for the same reason. Yes, yes. And, and there, there are serious questions about the competency of the organization generally, I think. Uh, even though it does have so many people, it just isn't able to accomplish much, it seems, especially with this uh, monkeypox outbreak. Uh, the messaging, which is really where so much of public health is accomplished, it's just in communicating um, facts and um, behavior modifications to people. Uh, and also being responsive to reports from physicians, hospitals, and individuals who may or may not be infected with monkeypox, among other diseases. The CDC has just done a very poor job of handling all of this. Um, and so it seems like now is a good time to turn elsewhere to find more reliable sources for information. And the Nigerian CDC has an excellent document, a 70 two-page document entitled Monkeypox Public Health Response Guidelines, in which they very thoroughly break down uh, really everything that uh, health providers and uh, health departments would need to know about monkeypox, including transmission, um, interventions, how to uh, best surveil populations for it, uh, laboratory procedures, so on and so forth. Very, very comprehensive. Uh, most of which is not of much use to the layperson. However, they do, in a brief section, discuss modes of transmission. And uh, in Nigeria, there is a real risk of uh, zoonotic transmission from animals to humans. So scratches, bites, contact with blood from wild animals, or not even wild, potentially domesticated animals too. Um, which is probably not an issue in the US, at least at this point, although certainly it is possible that just like with COVID, um, that animals, both wild and domesticated, can become reservoirs for monkeypox in North America too. But um, uh, some of the most useful takeaways in this document are the human to human transmissions and what, how those transmissions occur and what steps people can take to prevent transmission. And what they say in this document is, first of all, they do not emphasize sexual contact, which has been overemphasized in the American response. There's been some very unfortunate messaging or perception that the disease is spreading only among populations of men who have sex with men. And that is simply not the case. That is not true. It is not a sexually transmitted disease. It can be transmitted in, uh, with close contact, skin to skin contact, but not necessarily sexual contact. And so this Nigerian CDC document lays it out much more clearly that transmissions occur through uh, close contact, face-to-face -face contact, direct or indirect contact with uh, fluids and lesions and through respiratory particles. Oh, and this, is the, this is the big part right here is that respiratory transmission may or may not be the primary mode of transmission, but according to the Nigerian CDC, it is a mode of transmission. And so throughout the document, they repeat again and again that uh, healthcare providers should wear N95 respirators 
uh, along with other uh, protective equipment, uh, and that people who are infected should wear masks, and people who come into contact, like family members, uh, with those who are infected should also wear masks, ideally N95 respirators. So as if COVID wasn't bad enough, monkeypox, although not as transmissible, it certainly um, has quite a few uh, tricks in its arsenal. And so we can expect it too to be rather transmissible, not only by skin to skin contact and certainly not only a sexual contact, but even possibly through aerosol transmission. Yeah, I know the numbers are going up incredibly fast. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely epidemic spread at this point. Um, the, and with the school year just about to start, I yeah. think that Genie is well and truly out of the bottle at this point. Yep. Yeah. And, and I should also mention that the Nigerian CDC was successful in clamping down on past outbreaks of monkeypox. They actually got it under control multiple times. Um, of course, elimination was never feasible, but they were able to stop the epidemics before they got out of control. And they do it with contact tracing, right? Um, I don't know how they did it previously. But... I think that's how they did it. And as far as I can tell, contact tracing is extinct in America. It's just fake. Never did well, it. Yeah, there, there simply isn't, uh, there aren't enough uh, public health people available to do the work. Yeah. Well... At some point, we'll have so many plagues that we'll actually learn to become effective, presumably. Well, like I talked about last time, there's always the ACAM 2000 live attenuated smallpox uh, vaccine. Yeah. And yeah. so maybe they'll roll that out. Maybe so. All right. And uh, Caitlin has flight tracking. Oh, yes. I remember this. I think uh, somebody famous, Elon Musk, got in trouble with this, right? Uh, yeah, well, he tried to pay off somebody uh, <laughs> to yeah. take down, take it, take down some flight tracking stuff. Anyway, so uh, yeah, Tech Explorer has a article written by Joshua Melvin talking about how billionaires and very and and other and some bad people very much do not like flight tracking, and they think it should be taken down. And I think this is absolutely hilarious. So of course, this is in the news because Kylie Jenner gone on that like one jet <laughs> to go you know take you know a 10 minute flight for no reason on a private jet um and of course anyone's private jets uh, can be tracked uh this is this part par for the course <laughs> and uh billionaires and very rich people are and and also uh governments that are uh, a bit fascists very much do not like this, which to tell you this stuff is really good and really important. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so we already talked about Elon Musk paying $5,000 to try to get a Twitter account taken down. Um, so what's what's going on? What what are What's this flight tracking? Is this an invasion of, of privacy? Uh, no, absolutely not. So I'm going to share my screen again. What's going on is that all air traffic uh, has uh, a transponder uh, that's transmitting a protocol called ADSB. Uh, I've, I've actually played a lot with this protocol due to my work in aerospace. This broadcasts on uh, 1080 megahertz or 1.08 gigahertz. And it, uh, all air, aircraft are supposed to have it, and it transmits the location, heading, et cetera. And you can use that as, with a bunch of ground stations to create maps like this one, which shows every flight in the United States. Um, and of course, if you know what flights celebrities or billionaires or politicians are on, uh, you can track that too. And, to, and to, let, to make it very clear that this is not an invasion of privacy or, or uh, you know, a security issue, even um, the president's aircraft, uh, what is it, aircraft one, um, uh, whatever that one is. Uh, that one is tracked as well. All aircraft are required to have this. Uh, military jets have ADSB. You can track military jets. Um, and uh, you can use that to, like I said, track any aircraft. And if you know your, what aircraft your celebrity uses, uh, you can track that as well. And exclusively, this has been used uh, to basically suss out bad behaviors. So a good example of this is the fact that the uh, Trump administration uh, sent uh, flights to like surveil peaceful protesters and stuff. Uh, and they got in trouble for that. Um, of course, there's the example of Kylie Jenner. Uh, and, you know, people might say, oh, well, what about like privacy issue, like if you're a celebrity, 
uh, airports are public spaces. Airspaces are public spaces. You're going to public spaces. You know, there, you have no, you know, right to super privacy in those spaces. That's a moot point. And like I said, I, I don't know of any any time this has been used to like commit a crime or do something bad, but it has been used over and over again uh, to find bad behavior and call it out. And of course, aircraft are not the only uh, vehicles tracked uh, using similar technologies. So all marine traffic as well uh, is tracked. Uh, and I, I forget the the protocol marine traffic uses. Uh, it's not ADSB, but it, it's something similar. But as you can see, you can create similar maps with marine traffic, and you can see all the shipping lanes. And if you know that you're a celebrity or um, or someone you know is on a cruise ship, you can track the cruise ship. Uh, this is a standard you know, safety protocol stuff. Um, and of course, not just a land, not just air, uh, not just sea and air, of course, we also have, oops, um, every satellite uh, is also tracked. So here's a good example of everything in a low earth orbit, um, including, if, oh, here's a good Starlink uh, train uh, right here. So we can see all the new Starlink satellites that just went up. Um, so every everything that's not a car, essentially is tracked. Uh, and this has never been a, a security issue. Um, like I said, lots of highly security, high security agencies uh, still enforce ADSB. But when billionaires, of course, get in trouble because people know what they're doing, uh, um, they suddenly call for its, uh, call for its uh, erasure, essentially. So yeah, keep it up, people. This is good. Well, very interesting stuff. I should probably write a project where people track things down using that data. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you can use one of those cheapo $20 um, uh, SDRs, the RTL blog uh, SDR, um, or just an RTL SDR. That'll mm -hmm. receive 1080 gigahertz. Uh, and you can use that to uh, download or, or track overhead flights. In fact, I did that at City College back when I was doing astronomy. Um, and a bunch of people were wondering, is that legal? And it, yes, of course, it is very legal. It is very, very legal and encouraged. I encourage everyone to check out their local 1080 megahertz uh, airwaves. Well, this is great. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Friday.